Okay, so we're going to talk today about uh, read file methods. Continue to talk a little bit more about read file methods, and uh, maybe compare them with PCH codes. Okay, so that will be the agenda for the day. So let me begin once again uh, by uh, talking about the definition of this uh, read file methods. Uh, so if you want a error correcting RS code. Over GF2 bar M and length is N and what is uh, so, so what should N be? So if you want to over GF2 bar M, N should definitely be less than 2 bar M, right? So it should be less than or equal to 2 bar M minus 1. Okay. And then uh, how do I define the code? I can define the RS code for this, for instance. I can say all multiples of what? X plus beta, X plus beta square, all the way to X plus beta by 2 p. Okay, so I'll see of X equals 4, so stop. Degree of C of X is less than or equal to N minus 1. Okay, so I can do that. Okay, so that would be a very valid definition for the read solomon code. This guy is called the generator polynomial G of X. Okay, and that controls a lot of the properties. Okay, so like I said before, instead of starting from beta and going to beta part two t, you can start at beta part b, then go to beta part b plus one, beta part b plus two, so until beta part b plus two t. In fact, you don't even have to go one step at a time. You can go, uh, you can go in an arithmetic progression as long as the common difference is relatively prime to the order of the order of beta. Okay. So, so, for instance, it's very common to take beta to be a primitive element of the of 2 bar m. Okay. So, so things like that you can do. So, this is a very most common choice. It's called what it defines what's known as a narrow sense the read Solomon code. Okay. So, if you pick like this, it becomes narrow sense. And similarly, instead of picking n to be less than 2 bar m minus 1, you may want to pick n equals 2 bar m minus 1. In which case you get a primitive length. Okay, so those are it's just some terminology in jargon. It's not really any major theory there, just to fix the ideas. So those are some additional things which I didn't mention, which you can do with the Solomon methods. Okay, and uh, the minimum distance. So the dimension k is basically n minus two t, right? And the minimum distance t is two t plus one. And uh, error correcting capability is of course it's t error correcting. Okay. Remember the code is over GF2 par m, it is of length n, each coordinate of the code word is from GF2 par m. Okay, so how many code, code words are there in this code? The size of the RS code is basically what? Number of code words in the code and that will be equal to 2 par m raised to the power k. Okay, so it's a rather large, uh, large set. Alright, so this is like about the code. Then as far as the decoder is concerned, we have a bounded distance decoder. So it can be described algebraically. The basic point of that is, if you have, uh, so, so so what you end up doing is you compute the syndrome polynomial. So I define the first one x to the first two x bar plus two one two, plus two t x bar two t. And then you construct the other second polynomial, which is one by the first one x one plus x two x two one two one plus x w x. Okay, so if you have w errors. And then you notice that if you write this polynomial as sorry one plus sigma mu x bar x bar sigma w x bar w, you get linear equations. What what what? Sigma one, sigma two, sigma w, and Right, S1, S2, S2, okay. So using these linear equations, you solve for sigma 1 through sigma w, and then you go and find the roots of the sigma of x, you get the error locations. Once you find the error locations, you can do a simple uh, operation to find the error values. Okay, so that's the steps in the decoder. Another way to describe the decoder, which is very commonly done, is to look at this product. In fact, this is how we derive the, these equations. How did these linear equations come from? Sigma times x 
sigma of x times s of x is equal to 1. So, if you view this product modulo x bar t, x bar 2 t, what should happen? You should get, you will get some polynomial, maybe I will call it z of x, ok. What is the special thing about this polynomial? It has got degree less than or equal to w, right, right. So, in a way in your decoder, you are also trying to minimize w, alright. Right? So, s of x is given to you, you do not know this guy, you have to find this guy and you know that z of x modulo x bar 2t, why am I doing, why am I doing modulo x bar 2t? Beyond 2t plus 1 there will be some terms, ok, so we cannot control that. So, modulo x bar 2t, I know that, I think it is x bar 2t plus 1, right? Yeah, up to 2t it can be there, 2t plus 1 it should not be there, ok. So, I, I, I do not know that. So, so another way of tracing the same solutions is to find sigma of x such that sigma of x times s of x modulo x bar 2t plus 1 has least degree. Okay, that is the other way of tracing the same decoding problem. Okay. There is some minor proving there to show that both of them are equivalent, but you can do that. Okay. So, if you find the sigma of x such that sigma of x times s of x modulo x bar 2t plus 1, what do you mean the modulo x bar 2t plus 1? Just throw away all terms x bar 2t plus 1 and higher. Okay. That product should have least possible degree. Once you find that sigma of x, you are done with the decoding. You can simply take that as a symbol. Okay. And what we did in the method that I described, we get a list of linear equations and then you start at w equals t, then you keep going to t minus 1, t minus 2, till you get to the lowest possible thing. Okay. So, which is the same as this question. Okay. Most of the nicer decoding methods which can actually be implemented in practice, they will always use that approach. Okay. They will start with an iterative method. They will start with the sigma of x of y degree 1. Okay. Right. Sigma of x of degree 0 means clearly, I mean, there is no errors, right. So, sigma of x of degree 1 and see if this all, so this equation is satisfied, ok. So, in fact, if, if it does not satisfy it, there will be some higher order terms, ok. So, sigma of x. So, you, so, you, so, then you go to second degree, third degree, so on, ok. So, you keep iteratively finding sigma of x till you get to a point where you get this, uh, get this possibility to be satisfied, ok. So, think about that for a while. And most of the Bellicamp decoding method, Euclidean method, sequence element method, all these methods use this idea, ok, how to solve this equation. In fact, this equation is called the key equation. Ok, the key equation because of its importance. Right. So, and remember you have to find the least degree sigma is x. Uh, least degree sigma of x, which will give you the lowest degree set of x. Okay, in a way, there are so many low least degree things going on here. Okay. Find a sigma of x, which gives you the least possible degree set of x. That is the correct answer. But that will in invariably mean that you find the least degree sigma of x also. Okay. Is it okay? Is it clear? Okay, so, that is the that is the idea and boundary distance decoding. So, this part of it I did not emphasize because I think some people are doing projects on it. Hopefully, when they make presentations, they will go into some detail here. Okay. So, that will be, uh, that will be something important. Okay, any questions on this? Hopefully, it is roughly clear, yes? Right? Both of them will end up being similar things. That is what, that is what we need some proving. Yeah, so there is some proving there, like I said. That this will actually give you the yeah, give you the boundary distance. Right. Yeah, like I said, there is some part of it which needs to be proved, but it's not quite difficult, not very difficult. You can you can prove it. Right. Okay, but the goal is definitely find a sigma of x so that set of x has least degree. That is the correct goal, and that will invariably involve that in mean that sigma of x will have to have lower. Okay, some crazy thing can happen. I mean, so if there are two more than t errors, for instance, some crazy thing can happen. So you will take care of all those things and prove it. Right. Okay, so that is the boundary distance decoder and I am not going into too many details, but that uh, will uh, call it quits. Okay, uh, the next, la only one last thing I want to mention is correcting erasures and errors. Okay, and the BCH decoder also for this. Okay, so before that I will mention very quickly. So, if I do not pick m equals 2 power m minus 1, I pick m to be smaller than 2 power m minus 1. Okay. 
what happens? What is nice about picking n equals 2 pi m minus 1? You get a cyclic code, maybe you are happy about it. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, the product of g of x is valid all the time. But you maybe you are happy about having a cyclic code, etc. Okay? So that's one reason. But if I pick n to be strictly smaller than 2 pi m minus 1, the code that I get is actually very closely related to the code that you get by n equals 2 pi m minus 1. What is the relationship? Can you see something? It's being the relationship. So what you can show, like we did for the BCH code, you can just view the entire parity check matrix. So I restrict n to be something, what am I doing? I'm simply setting the remainder pa remaining part to 0. Okay? So the, the, if I make n to be less than 2 pi m minus 1, I have a shortened version of the original code. Okay? So it's a shortened version. So it's not really different from the primitive n equals 2 pi m minus 1 code. If you just add zeros to the end, you will get a code word of the n equals 2 pi m minus 1 code. Okay, so it's a shortened version. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So let's forget about that for a while. Let's move on to correcting errors and erasures. Okay. So, so, so what's the model when I have errors and erasures? Okay. So in general, instead of just so so far, we've been looking at w errors, w less than or equal to t. Okay. In general, you can have w errors and say e ratios. Okay. What do I mean by e ratios? There are e positions in my received vector. Okay. So my received vector r now is going to be r0, r1, r n minus 1. Each r out belongs to what? Belongs to either g of 2 power n or this epsilon which denotes Iteration. Okay, right. Each element, uh, each vector, each uh, coordinate that I receive is either an element from G of two parent or some special symbol which I call as iteration. What what does that mean? It means that some block before my decoder, some communication block before my decoder, has somehow concluded that those m bits are not very reliable. Okay, so somehow based on other information and soft information, etc., I concluded that those bits are not very reliable. So I am alerting my decoder to the, to the very strong possibility that that position might be an error. Okay, so that's called this erasure idea. So now what happens is when you have W errors and E erasures, there's some confusion at the decoder. Because the reason is what is the first step that you do in your decoder? You compute the syndrome, which assumes that you know R exactly as in at least you have some idea of R. If you say epsilon, you can't compute anything with epsilon, right? So what do you do? You have to make some substitution. It turns out what you can do is in BCH we had to do some special thing, right? I mean, if you remember what we did for BCH, we had to put all zero, all one, do two decodings, all such kinds of stuff. Here it's not needed. Okay, it's enough if you simply substitute it to be all zeros, for instance, or anything else. You can take any arbitrary values for those erasures and proceed with your decoder. Okay, so the first step when you have erasures is set erase R out to Okay, so whenever you have epsilon in your received value, simply put 0. In fact, instead of 0, you can put anything else, it does not matter. Okay, it will not change anything. Now, let us go and look at our error locator polynomial. Okay, so you have an error locator polynomial, which will be 1 plus x1x, 1, x, 1 plus x2x, 1 plus xwx. X. This will be the locations of errors, and you do not know any of these x1 through xw. And then you can also have, let us say, uh, a gamma of x, which I will call as the erasure location polynomial, 1 plus uh, x1 prime x, 1 plus x2 prime x, so on till 1 plus x prime e x. And what are these x primes? These xj's are error locations, they are unknown. What are the xj primes? They are the known erasure locations. Is that clear? Okay. So I have now two polynomials, sigma of x, which is an unknown degree w error locator polynomial. And then I have the gamma of x, which is a known degree e error erasure locator polynomial. Okay. Now what I can do is I can multiply this sigma of x and gamma of x. Okay. Then, what will be the degree of this guy? 
W plus E, but the number of X I know. Okay. And then when I multiply the number of X, I will again have very similar possibilities. Remember, what will be my E of X, the error, error, actual error that happened? Okay, so E of X will be the error vector. It will be E1, uh, X1, uh, no, 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 X1. So let me just not do this one, yeah. So it will look like uh, X power I1 plus for example E1 X power I W, right? I W X power I W. When you have the erasure locations, which are so E1 prime X power J1, for example E E prime X power J E, right? So I have my error part and my erasure part, and each S S I or uh, let's say S uh, S L the L syndrome will be what? E of beta power L, right? So what happens then? I will have E1. Remember, uh, Xj is what? Beta power Ij. And Xj prime is beta power J. Okay, so <laughs> there's too many uh, things here. So let me, let me make it uh, M here. Okay? Is it okay? Right? So, so these are my uh, error locators and erasure locators. And now, now if I do this, my S will become X1 power L plus Toronto EW X W power L plus E1 prime X1 prime power L plus Toronto EE prime X1 prime power L. Is that okay? I am going a little bit faster, but hopefully I can slow down a little bit also. Okay? So these are my error locators. These are my erasure locators. Am I right? Right? So the error locators are unknown, erasure locators are known. Okay? So now when I put E, e of beta power L, what do I get? E1 beta power L I1. But what is beta power I1? X1. So I put X1 power L. So on to EW, XW power L. Now what about for prime? E1 prime, beta power L, J1. What is beta power J1? X1 prime. So I put X1 prime power L. Okay. So I have both these things. Okay. Now if I define an SFX and multiply SFX by sigma of X and times gamma of X, I can use my same simplification rule as before and conclude, conclude what? Oh, X E prime. Okay. okay. All right. So I can use my same method as before to multiply sigma of X times gamma of X times S of X and then conclude that X bar W plus E plus 1 through X bar 2 T will have to be 0 in that product. Is that okay? Okay. So I, now I can conclude that sigma of X times gamma of X times S of X has no terms from x bar w plus e plus 1 to x bar 2t. Okay? So now what do we do next? Solve for? Of only sigma. Okay? So that's the important thing. Keep that in mind. Well, I know gamma of x already. So I'll take gamma of x, multiply with s of x happily. I'll get some other polynomial. Let me call it something else. I don't care. And then I will take my sigma of x and multiply by that new polynomial that I know. So, okay, so this part is known. Okay, so that's the crucial part. Okay. So how many unknowns do we have in these equations? Well, only W un W unknowns. And how many equations can you hope to get? 2t minus w minus e. So as long as 2t minus w minus e is greater than w, I can hope to solve it. And you can show also that you can solve it. Okay, so that's the next step which can be done. So I can solve for W variables sigma 1, sigma 2 to sigma W is 2t minus W minus e is greater than or equal to W. So if you put the push it around, we'll see W plus e by 2 is less than or equal to Okay, which is same as what we had before. Okay, number of errors plus number of erasures by 2 should be less than or equal to the error correcting capability, then you can correct. Okay? And the method is even simpler than the BCH code. You don't have to do any major modification to your decoder. Okay? You don't have to run two different decoders, one with 0, one with 1 and 
get confused and all that. Okay? So you can simply do set it to any arbitrary thing. For instance, if you want some simplicity, just simply set it to zero. You will get some evaluation. Then proceed with your decoder as it is, except that you take your erasure locator polynomial, multiply with your SFX, and then proceed with the same decoder. Okay? No, no major uh, change. Is so, it okay? Any questions on this? Okay. Right. So, so erasure correction is very popular. Okay. So, for instance, what will happen is, you can imagine hard drives or C, maybe not in CD too much, but hard drives particularly, if some sector is known to be bad, okay. So, your OS once in a while will go through and mark some sectors as bad. Or some parts will be known to be bad. Okay. So, what will happen is invariably it's because of some scratch, okay, a scratch on the disk. Okay. There can be circuitry which will find out whether there is a scratch or not. Okay. And then what you read out of a scratch is just nonsense. Okay, so whenever you encounter a scratch, the circuitry that is there to detect the scratch will tell your decoder that you know what these parts are not very sure about, let us just erase it. Okay, so it will be erased and that will go as erasure to your uh, decoder. Okay, so the read solvent decoder will use those erasures and try to correct it. Okay. So so what's the big deal about doing erasures other than rather than errors? Okay, so for instance if W is zero, you can correct twice as many erasures as errors. Okay. And that helps. Okay, and mostly if you imagine uh, a scratch on the disk is mostly going to be sequential. Okay, so, so scratch on the disk will be introduced what is known as a burst error. So, so it is not like random errors. Errors if they start, there are going to be many more errors for a while. Okay, And you can imagine naturally so that is very well suited for a read Solomon code. Why is that? Because if there is a sequence of errors in bits, there are very few symbol errors. Right. If you go to GF2 power m elements, m errors in a sequence will most probably be like 1 or 2 symbol errors, 1 or 2. That's right. So, that, that gives you an advantage with, with using the solvent code. So, that's why naturally for these kind of applications, for optical drives, hard drives, magnetic drives, read solvent codes are used quite heavily. Okay. So, today there is some more to change it also, but anyway, read solvent codes are very popular, they have been always popular for those, those reasons. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about DCH versus read solvent. So the question is about how do you compare DCH and read solvent in terms of encoding. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the comparison. There are some very stark uh, differences between the two. Okay, so we're going to go to that next. Okay. So, so that's the uh, that's the thing. So one last thing I want to mention this this notion of a burst error correcting capability. So what is the burst error correcting capability of a of a DCH code of a read solvent code? Okay, we know the error correcting capability is T. What do I mean by that? It can tolerate T random bit errors. Okay, so, so once again, what, so I have to define this very carefully here. So I have, let's say, an NK uh, T error correcting RS code over G of 2 power M. Okay, suppose I do this, my actual code is, is will take MK bits and then encode it into how many bits? MN bits. Okay, so these bits are sent on the channel. Let me say instead of random errors, so if I say channel is introducing random errors, what is the maximum error correcting capability? T. Okay, so you can't go more than T. There is a T plus one weight error sequence which cannot be corrected by my boundary distance decoder. Okay, so definitely even very solid. Okay. So on the other hand, if I say the channel is constrained to introduce errors in bursts. Okay. So let's say it starts at one point and it can introduce errors for B bits starting at that point, not more than B. Okay. The next B bits. Okay. So if I say that, what is the maximum B that can be corrected by this decoder? Is my question. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Did you understand? So channel can introduce bursts of bursts, errors in error, errors in bursts of length B. Okay, some B. So what is the maximum B that is always correctable? So for instance, if B is one, clearly it's correctable. B up to T is also correctable. Yes. If so you do the errors in T bursts or length of T or random it can be corrected. So obviously up to T it's possible. Is anything more than T possible if you are restricted to burst? That's the question. 
Okay. Yeah, so do you see why, why he got that? So the tempting thing is to say m, m times t. Okay. So you, you might think m times t is the best error correcting capability, right? So imagine what is happening, okay? So the code word when it goes through the channel, I said it's m times m bits, but it's going as c0, which is m bits, m bits, and then c1, which is another m bits, c2, which is another m bits, and so on, right? Till the last one, c n minus 1, which is another m bits. Right? This is how it's going. So my burst can start anywhere. Okay, that is the important thing to keep in mind. My burst can start anywhere and go for a length b. Okay? If it starts exactly between two symbols, if it is constrained to start only here, then even if it is of length mt, I will only have t symbol errors. But it can start exactly one before the this thing. Okay, that's the worst case. So it can start like somewhere here. Okay, right? If it does that, then what can happen? Okay, m t minus one times m plus this one. Okay, so one more if you hit, you will get two people. Okay, so only t minus one times m plus one best errors can be reliably always corrected by this. Uh, can be guaranteed 100% to be corrected by the result. Okay. Is that clear? Did you see the point? So I got t minus one guys. Okay, all the next t minus one will be erased. Because I get hit one here, this one will be also affected. If I even add one more, one more symbol will be affected and that will go to t plus 1. Okay. So max b equals t minus 1 times m plus 1. Okay. So that many burst errors can be corrected. Okay. So that is a huge advantage with read solvent codes. If you know that the errors are going to be in bursts. Okay. There are several reasons why you might know ahead of time that the errors will be in bursts. Okay. So if it is going to be in bursts, for instance, Fading is one more uh, kind of scenario you can think of. So if you go into a fade, it's, it's going to be in a fade for a while and then you come out. Okay? So those are just sort of so many different ways of thinking about it. But of course, nobody uses read solvent codes wireless. So that's a different point. But but those are ways in which you which you can justify. It, okay. So this is best uh, uh, burst error correcting capability. So normally, uh, if you know that you are doing things in burst. There is a way to improve your best error correcting capability. Okay, so that is by what's known as interleaving. Okay, this is a very common strategy that's used in hard drives particularly. So what you do is, also it's a very simple thing. So so if you want to do interleaving up to that n, you take n code words. Uh, so I need some notation here. So what are my n code words? So let's say C01, C11, Cn minus 1, 1, and C02, C12, Cn minus 1, 2, all the way down to C0, and C1n, Cn minus 1. Okay, so I take n code words. Normally, I would send one row at a time, row wise, right? But instead of sending it row wise, I can send it column wise. If I send it column wise, what happens to my best error correcting capability? It roughly gets multiplied by n. Okay, so of course, you have to be slightly careful here. You can position yourself somewhere this way. So you will also get n minus 1 times t minus 1 times something like that. Okay, roughly what happens is your best error correcting capability gets multiplied by n. Do you see that why? Do you see why? If I send it column wise, what happens? If even if I even if I erase all these guys, how many errors am I introducing in each code word? And even if there is an error in all of these things, only one error is being introduced in each of the code words. So like roughly I can do this for t t such thing. So t times n times m is what you can expect. But of course there's an adjustment you have to do. It won't be exactly t times n times m, it will be some t minus one times m plus one times n minus one. So something else will come, but roughly t times n times. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so max b for this guy goes to roughly t times n times n. Okay, so this is a strategy that's also used. What's the penalty you pay when you implement this strategy compared to the previous one? What is the penalty you pay in an implementation with this code? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah, you need a lot of memory, there will be something called latency, okay. So, latency could be a critical thing in your application. If, if the application cannot tolerate latency, it won't work. Okay, so, you have to wait for like n guys before you can send it out. Request on the receiving side, you have to wait for n days before you can decode anything, okay. So, those are uh, problems in uh, real life that you can overcome. Okay, so, your standard way, interleaving is a very common thing that is done. Okay, later on in the next class, we are doing the next course, you will see that interleaving is used for more fancy things than just this, okay. But for now, we can think of burst uh, error thing as a good way of doing interleaving. Okay, so the next thing I am going to point out is the comparison between DCH and read code. Okay, so it is a bit difficult to make proper careful comparisons. You will see why, because read Solomon codes are your ROG of 2 par n, they have symbol error correcting capability D. DCH codes are binary and all that, okay. So, it is a bit uh, confusing to make the comparison. So, I will describe it in a certain way, okay. So, I will say my block length is fixed as n, n bits, okay. Somehow, I fix that my block length has to be n bits, not, not symbols or anything, n bits, it is fixed as n bits, okay. And let us say my error correcting capability needed is T. T bit errors. Okay. So, one can imagine why this is reasonable. Okay. So, if you are building a communication system, you might know that you cannot wait for more than n bits. Okay, so your latency requirements and this there will be a circuitry in your communication system which tracks the timing. Okay, so you know if it keeps on n bits, the timing has to be tracked. And n usually is fixed by those things. You know, I mean it's not fixed by something else. You, your, your timing can only track for so long. Your errors can only accumulate for so long. So you will have some fix uh, you, you'll be fixed on some n, n bits, you can't say that. So for so those n bits, based on your error models, you might know that at most you will get the errors. Okay. So those are, so this is a reasonable place to start. So you say n bits is my uh, block length and I, I expect say at most T errors. There is no way or the probability that I will get more than T errors is really, really small that I do not have to design for it. Okay, I do not have to worry about it. So that is the way you can think about uh, this setup. Okay. So now suppose somebody says I can build a DCH code for it and suppose somebody says I can build a read element code for the same thing. Okay, but remember we will say these are, these are random errors. Okay, T random errors. Because in most models random is what is more likely. Okay. If you have of course best errors then there are other, other things to worry about but for random errors. Okay. So, that is our comparison will be for random errors only. Okay. Suppose I say this, I want to compare a read Solomon design versus a DCS design and comment on various things, complexity, performance, which is better etc. Okay. So, that is the kind of approach I am going to take. Okay. It is not, there are other approaches like I said but this is one approach and we will see how it goes. Okay. Alright. So, what will happen if I have to Design a BCH code for this. What is your first step? How would you do a BCH code? I'm sorry? Well, I define a beta, right? I define a beta whose order is greater than n. Okay, so one simple way of doing it is to take a beta which is a primitive element of g of 2 par m, and 2 par m is the smallest power of 2 greater than n. Okay, so, you can do that. Okay, so, that is a very standard way of doing it. Well, let us fix on that. Okay. So, we will fix m such that 2 power m is greater than or equal to n minus so n, right? So, it should be n. Uh, n minus 1 should be equal to, so let me just say e greater than or equal to. Okay, so, that is fine. Okay. And then I fix my beta as a primitive element of g of 2 power m. Okay, so that gives me the beta that I want. Okay, right? Is that fine? So how do you describe the smallest m which is greater than uh, such that two par m is greater than or equal to n? There is a way to roughly say what it will be of the order of m will be of the order of log n zero. Okay, so so that's the idea. So you have to go if you want n, you have to go to an m which is log n base two. Is that okay? There might be, I mean, in specific cases we can do something else, but, but let me just keep it generic like this. Okay, so log n is the kind of thing you have to go, maybe 2 times log n or lo log n plus 1 or something. Or 2 times log n. So maybe the next one you should go for that is great. Okay. So you pick a beta that is primitive 
And then I want error correcting capability T. Okay, so what will be my case? N minus M T, right? Let's say we are in the domain, so T is not so high that this is going to be violated. So let's say K equals N minus M. Okay, so we can, this is actually an assumption. But it is true. I mean, in general K will be greater than this episode. So I don't know, I have no problem in assuming uh, N K equals N minus M. Right? And uh, let's say what happens in the RS code world. What do you do in the RS code? Should I pick the same data from the same two parent? No, okay, so that's the important thing to keep in mind because my number of my block length is fixed as n bits. Okay, remember that is very very important. Okay, so what I can do is I can come up with the length n RS code over some GS2 par, let's say capital M. What should be the constraint? n times m should be. Yeah, it should be greater than or equal to n. Okay, so let's say it's equal. Mostly it's going to be equal. So let's say greater than or equal to n. Okay, so what what can your uh, so 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 there is a there is a choice here. So how do I do this? How do I nicely give a flavor for what n will be? Any ideas? Again, by 2c. Remember, the maximum n can go for a fixed m is what? 2 power m minus 1. Okay? So we can go to the maximum m. So let's say we fix, we take n to be the largest for us for us for a fixed m. So n can be roughly replaced with 2 power m, right? So 2 power m times m should be greater than or equal to n. Okay, so what will be m then? Okay, it can be much smaller than log m. Am I right? Okay, m can definitely be smaller than log m. Okay, right? 2 power m greater than or equal to n gives you log m. 2 power m times m greater than or equal to n will give you something smaller than log m. Okay, not, maybe not uh, drastically smaller, but still definitely significantly smaller it can be. Okay, so if you want a specific example, you can take, let's say, n equals this number I like a lot, 2040. Okay. So if you wanted a BCH code, what is the smallest M that you have to go to? 2048, which is 11. What about the Reed Solomon code? M equals 8 is good enough. Okay, 255 times 8 equals 2040. Okay, so this is a this is the thing. This gives you M equals 11, and this gives you capital M equals 8. Okay, so you will go you will go lower when you go to a BCH code. I mean a Reed Solomon code. Okay. Is that an advantage using a smaller field or a disadvantage? I mean, today you may not think too much of 2 power 11, but definitely 2 power 11 will take more circuit complexity than 2 power 8. Okay. So if you are spending so much effort and power and circuit area for 2 power 8, the GS2 power 8 implementation, you will be spending more for GS2 power 11. For instance, the chain search, okay, chain search is it's going to be painful. Okay. You have to search for 2040 guys. Over in uh, in uh, in BCH here in the reach code we will be only doing 255. Okay, a lot of things will be simpler in the reach code. Okay, but is there any advantage? What is K? What is K for this code? N minus. T. Okay, so that is an important thing. It's very very important. Okay, is it okay? All right. So when I multiply by m, okay, so I'm, when I multiply by capital M, I go to a small k which is small n minus two times m times t, and the capital M is there. Okay. Is it okay? Do you see that? So, if you multiply by capital M, what happens? K times M equals M times N minus 2 T M. Is that okay? So, that M times will come in the 2 T. Okay? So, let us do this M equals to 2040 and fix a definite example. So, let us say for instance, we fix T equals 
uh, something like uh, 10, let's say 20. Okay, and equals 2,500. Okay, so we have the We saw before that the BCF you need m equals 11, and k will be 2,040 minus 11 times 20 is what? 220. That will give you something like. Is that a problem? Is it okay? So it will be 1820, right? That's what will be k. What happens in the RS? What happens in the RS form? Okay, so you can pick m equals 8. I'm going to use small m here. Okay, so I know it's an abuse of notation, but hopefully you can see that. And then uh, 255 comma what? 255 minus 40. Okay, remember that. That is the penalty you have to pay here. Okay, so it's going to be 215 over g of 2 power 8. And that will translate into what? 2040 comma what? What is 215 times 8? 1720. Okay, in bits. Okay, so for the same error correcting capability and the same block length, you can send 100 more message bits if you use BCH codes. Okay, you, you will have to send 100 less message bits if you are using read solvent code. But what is the advantage? Read solvent codes will be doing only crossing over GF2 par 8, but in BCH codes will be doing crossing over GF2 par 11. Okay? In BC, read solvent codes will be only searching for one among 255 routes. In read solvent code, you have to in BCH code, you have to search for one among 2040 routes. Okay? So, everything is just amplified significantly in the BCH code. Okay? So, this is the way you can compare uh, between the two. Is that okay? Okay, so there are so many other things you can do. For instance, a very common next thing you can do is writing expressions for probability of block error in each of these two situations. Okay, right? If you do a bounded distance decoder, you know T errors can be corrected in 2040. Here it is a more complicated formula, right? Remember, T errors can be corrected in 255 symbols. So, you have to go from first bit errors to block errors and then use the formula. Okay, so there are two different formulas, and maybe it is not very easy to see how they behave and uh, actually have like a I have a clock here. I will maybe show you that. Okay, so I think I think there's a way to I keep forgetting this. I think there's a way to include this in journal. So so let me just insert this plot here. Oh, it doesn't like PDF, is it? Okay. I thought it was possible, but anyway. Okay. 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 So, I think what I can do is cut and paste this into the Windows channel. That is possible. If I do control C, control V, go. But anyway, we can just see it here. So, this is a plot of block error rate versus uh, versus something which I call EB over N0. I have not defined that in class here, but it is something like the error probability. Okay, the P that you have over your BSC. That, that can be converted into an EB over N0. And I have to tell you that going from left to right goes through goes to lower values of P. Okay, on the left hand side you have higher values of P. As you go to the right, you have lower values of P. Okay? Is that okay? Alright? So one curve I have is called uncoded. What do I mean by uncoded? That will be P itself. Okay, so that kind of gives you a hint of the mapping from P to E B over N1. Okay, it is some one to one map, but it is a crazy kind of map. You can ask me why I am doing it, it is for several reasons. Okay, it is a very commonly accepted thing to plot with E B over N0 as opposed to the uncoded P. Okay, and you can see that P decreases from something like 10 power minus 1 all the way to 10 power minus 6. Okay, and I have used the log scale here to capture the plot much better here. Otherwise, you cannot see anything. Okay, so I have done log scale to capture this area blow it up a little bit and here EB over N0 is the mapping. So, if I have like say a P of 10 power minus 2, 
I should go there and then map it to the EDR and not and then look at the other thing. Okay, so that's how you read this map. Read this uh, plot, okay? All right, so I plotted several things here. For instance, uh, I plotted what I called RS 255, 191, 65. Okay, 255, 191, or 65, huh? is that correct? Sorry? Yeah, so that's the minimum distance, that's not error correcting capability. So it's 65, which will be a 32 error correcting code. Okay, over G of 256. And that is the solid curve. Okay, and then the dotted line is the same similar BCH code. BCH code has the same block length, 2040, and same minimum distance, 65, which means it can correct 32 errors. But then the K is different, 1688. If you, if you compute it, you will see 191 times 8 is smaller than 1688. Okay, it will definitely be because 200 times 8 itself is the only 1600. 191 will be still further smaller. Okay, so it will be like 153 something, okay, 1528 or something. Okay, so that will be the number here. So it's definitely smaller than 1688. So in the read Solomon code, you are sending, you are sending one lesser number of message bits. The BCH code is sending more message bits. So BCH code has higher rate. But then what has happened here? BCH code's error curve is to the left of the read Solomon code. What does it mean? The performance is better, right? For the same probability of error, BCH code will give you a lower output probability of error than read Solomon code. Because it's on the left hand side, right? So, so for instance, if I pick this probability of error here, BCH code gives me the same probability of error. On the other hand, Reed-Solomon code gives me a much higher probability. Okay? So, not only is BCH code better in sending more rate, it's also better for sending, getting better performance. Okay? In terms of what is called coding gain. Okay? So, you get better gain compared to that. Okay? So, also have a similar plot for. Uh, 64 error correcting code, minimum distance is 129. I compare RS versus PCH, same block length, and the K there will be similarly different. And then you see once again that the BCH is doing better for random errors. Okay, for random errors, this will be the same. Okay, so this is basically the expressions that we derive. If you remember, we derived those expressions for probability of block error, right, for P error correcting capability. I wrote some expressions. So, so I'll write down this expression now, once again later, okay. So I've just plotted those expressions. So I'll tell you what expressions I've plotted now. Is it okay? So this idea is clear, right? So if you compare with the same block length and same error correcting capability, BCH is definitely better than Reed Solomon for random errors. That is no, there is no doubt. So what is the penalty you pay? You have to do more complex decoding okay, in BCH than. Okay, so let's move on to the the expression and tell you what expression is plotted. Okay, so so if you have if you have length n error correcting capability t, okay. So for the BCH code, probability of block error with a bounded distance decoder, okay, so I was in bounded distance decoder, is what? So out of n bits, if there are t or fewer errors, I can correct. If it is t plus 1 or greater, I will fail. I will assume this, I will fail, okay. And what is the probability of block error? It's 1 minus summation i equals 0 to t, n choose i, p power i, 1 minus p power n minus n. So that's a very simple expression for BCS. What do you have to do for each element? You have to first go from bit error to symbol error. That's the first step given an n. Then what is the next thing? Okay, so you have to define capital N to be small n by m and then you have to say probability of block error this is for read element, right? Read Solomon again bounded distance decoder will be equal to 1 minus summation i equals 0 to t capital N choose i ps power i 1 minus ps power capital N minus okay the expressions are quite different what you get here and then what you get here is that okay so these are the expressions that are plotted in the picture for each Solomon and BC Okay, so I think that roughly uh, gives you the points. So the main summary is BCH better than RS for fixed fixed uh, N and T. Okay, 
in terms of performance, but RS is got lesser complexity. And uh, in first error, error models, it was better. Okay, so first error models can be dealt better in the uh, reach on the phone. BCS code, you do not have any special first error correcting capability. Okay, so this is the simple comparison I wanted to do just to give you an idea. So, so if, if your errors are random, most people will use DCH codes today and today its complexity is not a big deal. So for instance the DVDS2 standard, the satellite standard, there is an inner code and then the inner code does some random errors and there is an outer DCH code for correcting errors. Just for the same error correcting capability it gives you better rate. Okay? We use DCH codes, we do not use Solomon codes. On the other hand, in uh, other communication systems, where, uh, mostly older communication systems, people use Reed Solomon because their inner blocks produce block errors, burst errors. So that, that's the model uh, that we use today. Okay, so we'll stop here for now, and this is pretty much going to be the end of Reed Solomon codes. From uh, the next week onwards, we'll begin uh, some other topic. Okay, I haven't exactly decided what topic I'm going to do. We'll do some other topic outside of uh, Reed Solomon codes. Okay.